Welcome to In the Background of Life with Kelly Ramsey, the podcast that invites you to sit down in a cozy living space, sipping a cup of tea while we embark on a captivating journey about our intentional narratives in our lives. I'm Kelly Ramsey, and this podcast is your warm space to unravel the stories woven into everyday moments. It's a tapestry crafted with intention and purpose. So grab your favorite cup of tea, settle in, and let's explore the unnoticed details that contribute to the intentional design of the world around us. Together, we'll celebrate the beauty in the threads that make life extraordinary. Welcome in to our new episode of In the Background of Life with Kelly Ramsey. And we are going to shift gears today. And I'm so excited that we are starting the school off, routines are settled, the kids have their class schedules and whatnot. We're settling back into our work. And so now we're going to turn our focus to support for families in community. And this is um, this is something we talk about often. People usually say it takes a village to raise a child. But what is the village really comprised of? And who's in that village? And how does community support with committed, dedicated people who are brave to create spaces for connection, for vulnerability, and to have open and honest dialogue. So today I'm really excited because I have an in-studio guest, Dr. Renee Butler-King. She's a friend, a colleague, and a fellow sojourner on this road to creating equitable systems for families and children that we serve. So welcome, Renee. Thank you for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. You're welcome. So would you just briefly introduce yourself and talk talk about your connection to this topic of family and community? Ooh, okay. I'm going to try to do this briefly because I know we've got some other work to do as well. I am Renee Butler King. I am um, a social worker. Um, you know, that's what I call myself, but I'm also um, an early childhood social worker. And that's kind of a new term for me. Um, after I finished um, my PhD, because uh, I have the master's in social work and then the PhD in early childhood education. And I did the early childhood education because I I um, started to run into some challenges around doing the work with families and in communities as it related to brown and black boys in preschool. Wow. So um, that's how I kind of come um this whole topic of family, although social work will, is a lifelong um, profession and it takes you across the lifespan. Mm-hmm. But um, the doc made me kind of situate myself early on. Um, and from my Casey days, it, it seemed to me it was where I could get the biggest bang from a buck. Mm. I love, you know, you know, you're talking my language. Early childhood is that area of uh, expertise, but also where we feel most comfortable because we're supporting children and families in those early years. And then that's going to launch them into their school age years. Mm -hmm. And so I love that um, we're going to get to share um, our stories. We're going to get to share our thoughts. And also we're going to get to share and provoke others to really create community for families as well. When you think about your work, is there any story or experience that stands out to you as you started to delve into your work? Wow. Actually, the the, the one thing that, that is grounding to me is uh, thinking about being a, uh, a servant in my community. And, um, and of course, that, that, that for me is, is a, a, a spiritual piece, right? But as I started to look at formal education, because I was a I was going to say I was a late bloomer. I don't know that I'm a late bloomer, but I'm definitely um, late in terms of formal education. How about that? Mm-hmm. And um, and as I started to look at how I might better serve my community, particularly as I was looking at formal education, what I realized was this is that within my community, there were lots of challenges um, that I saw people sick Mm-hmm. not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. And um, and I saw us afraid 
of um, accessing any services other than a preacher. Mm. And um, but I also has have this kind of um, little bit of a of a um, rebellious piece. And as I started to look at school, you know, there's some assessments and things that they do. And they told me that I'd be good at social work mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because it allowed me some autonomy. And I have been. It has served me well. And then as I began to do the social work, uh, mostly because I wanted to be able to serve within my community, African-American folk um, who were not who were only accessing uh, ministers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so. um so that's how I kind of got to where I am. Yeah. I, 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 it intrigues me because that is a pathway I'm very much familiar with. So in our community as African-American uh, women and um, growing up in, I grew up in the Bay Area in San Francisco, and the church was our core. So it was where we went when we had troubles, our woes, or we were down, or we were depressed, and we go in, we worship. We would feel the presence of God. We would be encouraged. But then we had to go home. And then we had to get through the week. And then we would look to that midweek service for that next pick-me-up, like a Wednesday night or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, growing up, we were taught that family business is family business. Right. We don't reach out of that family for help, for access, and we don't let people in. Right. And so those messages were both protective because we didn't always understand what resources were there and available, but they also were um, keeping us stuck, right, in those places. Right. And as a firstborn um, daughter, I was always reaching for like more and wanting to know more and do, you know, and do more. And so I can remember you talking about when I started my bachelor's degree we wrote about our family and I wrote, I got so much enlightenment. It was right after I had gotten divorced. So I was working, going to Southern Nazarene university. I had moved here from the Cal from California, I had always been in college, but never got a degree. So SNU was my first degree. Mm -hmm. And so as I was unpacking it, I remember like, I need to tell all the women in my family about this Liberty I have and telling their stories and whatnot. And so I wrote letters to every woman in my family, my grandmother, my auntie, my moms, and nobody responded except for my mom. But everyone went to talk to my mom about the letter. And the letter basically was saying that as women, we have voice and we have power and we need to live into our purpose and who we are. And never again, I told them a little bit about my divorce and my story because I was here, everybody else was in California. And I remember so distinctly, like, wanting to say, did you guys not read the letter? Did you not um, hear what I said? You can have this, too. But I understood the safety of going to my mom to talk about it, but also the courage it took for me to write the letter and to step out. And that was my first awakening to say, I have to be able to do more, that servant leadership piece and helping women get their voice and whatnot. And that was my first learning that even though I may be awakened in an area, not everybody is going to be awakened in the same way at the same time. Mm -hmm. That was when distinctly I remember how my community changed. So it was the church, but it was also books and learning and people I encountered whose stories were just like mine and having that like-mindedness and that belonging, and that's what continues to be at the forefront of what I want to create for other people. Wow, that's interesting, and I appreciate you sharing that because what it makes me think about was the fact that I was not as open. I was pretty closed, um, not just for all of the reasons that we stated before, but also because I lived in a um, the community that I lived in, and I and I was raised here in Oklahoma City. Um, was a pretty small community and it was closed off. And part of the way that we, part of the way that that community worked in, in my community was is that you really could not talk much at all mm -hmm. to people around. One was because my grandmother ran numbers and, um, and it's not just not something that you go out in the community and talk about. 
even though church people would come and all kind of people would come to her house, it was a very secretive um, adventure. And it wasn't until I was post, um, I want to say post masters, that I was working for the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. And um, and I just wouldn't tell stories. I just I just wouldn't. I just did my work and didn't tell stories. But what I found was as I began to work with people who were in recovery mm -hmm. from alcohol um, or or any other kind of recovery, and they had hired me to be their um, their cross cultural specialist. It was called at the time. You know, we've been called many things, yes. right? And so. Um, and I and 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 they they gave me the position and I sat for about six months and couldn't figure out why I wasn't working. And what I finally observed was is that I had not, I didn't have a story. Mm. So one of the ways that people who are in recovery learn to trust you is, is that you tell your story. Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't telling a story to anybody that I was working with all around. And I could hear the stories, but I wasn't telling mine because who do I tell mm -hmm. that my grandmother ran numbers mm -hmm. and that all of these things were happening at my grandmother's house um, to be able to work. And so and it wasn't until I became um, encouraged and brave enough to tell this story, mm -hmm. the, the one that we're talking about, the fact that my grandmother ran numbers and which is how she fed us. She actually, I will say, was probably my first uh, mentor and example of a social worker because at a table such as the one that we're sitting at, a round table, she bartered lots of things mm -hmm. for lots of people. Um, so there was this real gray area about uh, about the work that she did. And so once I found the, the nerve to um, tell that story, then um, you're right. I had I had some freedom and some liberation. Yeah, I we I remember us having a little bit of this conversation, which brought which brought you here today as a guest and um, telling the story of my husband's growing up mm -hmm. and his um, mom and grandmother ran a boarding house. Mm -hmm. So every evening for dinner, when they came to sit at the table at the appointed time, because if you were going to eat, you would be there to eat. It would have different people round about the table, yes. all different walks of life yes. in different stages. But what I heard when listening to my husband's story was that every person was respected for who they were. Yes. They were accepted for what they had to offer in that moment, in that time. Mm -hmm. They were welcomed in and there was grace always extended always. at the table. And that's that's the learnings that we have in community. And we, we use community loosely because I can create community around like interests are things and challenges that I might have. After I've told my story, people are connecting to where they are in that story. And then we're building on that. Mm -hmm. So think about for a minute in terms of family, being in community and representation, what does it look like? as uh, African-American, male, female, child, when you're not represented in the communities that are trying to serve you? What's the difference that it looks like when I see myself in your story versus when you tell a story and I can't make any connections at all? Wow. Whoa. Yeah. That's deep. That's deep. It's way deep. Yeah. And as yeah. a friend of mine would say with the People's Institute and wide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is deep and wide. Yes. Um, I know I, I don't I'm not I don't know that I'm gonna be able to answer that today. But 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 what it sparks in me as an educator, because I am an early childhood social worker. But I'm also a professor at the University of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. So I teach social workers. Um, I, I do diversity work in human relations. And it is, it is important for me to remember and to acknowledge when I'm on campus that um, the, the um, students um, and even some of my colleagues that look like me see me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, whether there is a um, long-term connection or not. I understand or overstand, as the Olive Zant would say, uh, from sitting at my grandmother's table, it is important that you know that I'm here. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And then I'm available. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
that that I, I may be able to create some options or we may be able to create some options together. Yeah. So I do know that. Yeah. I when you say that, um immediately my pic I I see a picture. So I hear and then I see a picture. The picture that I saw was a little African American boy who was in my three two year old classroom. And he had so much energy. And it was so important for me to create a space where he could use that up, mm -hmm. but also to be a voice to nap to navigate his story mm -hmm. of what he was trying to tell us and what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And that story wasn't just for the teachers. It was actually also for the mom because she was the youngest of the children, but he was the most busy about and not fitting into her like mode of how he should be doing. So I remember distinctly what I would report back to her at the end of the day how I would describe his love and vigor and the things that he did, mm -hmm. what adventures he was on. And I would use all of those words. And she always, she's like, you are like meant for this. And I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I experienced the same things, but I don't describe it as that, right? Because it was important for me to describe who he was, mm -hmm. how he was embarking on the world, but also to let him see and her see this is his full picture of who he is. Yes. Behavior is telling us a story. Are we reading that behavior for the story it's telling? Are we making up our own, right? right. And I, I found myself not only in that setting, but also working um, as an education manager, um, telling the story of my team members who were often misunderstood because of their disposition. And they would take that front face looking and say, oh, they're not easy to work with. Actually, they actually are a team player. Mm -hmm. And here's what they do. And so I didn't try and change the person or personality, mm -hmm. but I did give them a fair representation of who they were to make sure they knew that I saw them. And if I could see them, then we could have a relationship and begin to build from there. And for me, that's community. Like, mm -hmm. that's what I do when I create spaces, when I engage in conversations, I'm creating that community of what that looks like and recognizing that every one of those people come from a home, come from a family, have a story from childhood all the way until we meet them. Mm -hmm. They have a story. And I don't want it to reflect all of who they are and what they've come out of as well. So wow. that was one of my learnings that I had. That's pretty nice. And so what 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 that um what that kind of pushes me to to think about is um there's a woman by the name of uh, Hernandez Sheets who talks about um diversity uh pedagogy, diversity theory. Yeah. And she has these eight dimensions of oper operationalizing and and part of the work that I do with um pre-K brown and black boys is um to help families understand something that I called um, ITHXT, mm -hmm. which is Intergenerational Transmission of Historical Trauma. So what you, what you said to me in terms of um, developing family and community is, is that we're looking and, and, and trying to create a, a place for families to have some cultural safety mm -hmm. in the classroom for context and then self-regulated learning for at home. Mm -hmm. And so this ITHXT helped, teach, uh, helped teachers to move to this space where they can believe that students have the uh, capable capability and the desire to demonstrate positive behavioral patterns, mm -hmm. which is not typically what happens for brown and black boys in a classroom. Yeah. And so um, so part of, part of looking at, at, at the family and, um, and something that I can offer has to do with that mm -hmm. and um, and helping them to understand, you know, patterns and and enabling them to understand that they can help the teacher create this safe space, even if they don't know that that's not what they're doing or they don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and because what we're trying to help the um, the, the early childhood uh, person know mm -hmm. is, is that um, we need them to know how to self-regulate. That's not something that you just innately know. No, that's some. Those are some things that families have to work at. Yeah. And so, um, so if I'm coming into a community, 
I'm coming, I'm coming with that. You know, these are the things that I believe that I can help with and help develop that skill to understand and, and to monitor, you know, what joy and anger looks like and how we, and how we engage, um, our, particularly our sons mm -hmm. that we send out into the world to be formally educated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love one, this work, this body of work that you're unpacking and have been unpacking and so many roads of where it, where it will go. But when you, when you mention our, particularly our sons as a mother of black boys, I am always in tune with where they are and how, how they're received in the world, but also how they're doing within themselves. Mm -hmm. And so my, my listeners know I have a 12th grader this year and I was watching his brain connect from summer to start in the school year. And he was just ticker taping, like just running. Mm -hmm. And so first day of school, he came in. I was like, hey, how was, how was your day? He said, mom, it was a lot. It was a lot. I was like, okay, tell me about what is a lot. And I had told him earlier, this year, you're going to need to write things down. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to hold it all in your brain because you're holding so many aspects of your work and who you are. And so that first day was overwhelming. But by the end of the week, he was like, I got to feel, I know what I need to do because he was leaving just being a high school student to being a leader in his class, to being a college student, to having his brother on the um, varsity team with him. So he's modeling for his brother. He's holding all these things at the same time mm -hmm. and also being a classmate as well and a son and all the things. And so I thought about like what things, and I talked about it on the broadcast a couple of broadcasts ago, that every stage of parenting has carried him to where he is now. Mm -hmm. But now it's in his hands of how he's going to guide it in the next places. And I get to partner along with them for that. And then I thought about my youngest who flies by his own rules but is always in tune with processes as he goes through. So he's had a community of support from home, from, his, from us as parents, and then as the schools and teachers that help to guide him. So now he has some structural things that are already in place that he'll grow from, right? But then I always think, and when I think about my boys, I think about those boys who don't have that. So when do we run into their experiences? When do they develop that self-control or that self-regulation? And who's teaching them? Who's modeling that for them? And so I think a key piece in, in your work is not only working with those teachers, but working with those families. Definitely. Right? And being in tandem, working with both, because we don't, we don't give our children over to the schools to raise. We're raising our own children, mm -hmm. but you are partnering with us yes. in order to raise. Yes. So yeah, so that's what it sparked for me as you shared that. What's nice about it is, is that you do want a social worker in the mix. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you do, as we as we do this work, want a social worker in the mix, particularly an early childhood social worker, even if the child is older. Yeah. And so, as, 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 as you said, as I'm working on this body of work, then you have to look at the social ecological approach to things, you know, so that we can do some preventive work as well as the real-time work that has to be done. And I think what's so nice about what you just said uh, is is that children, um, um, let me see, I think it's Brandon Ford who says this, and I'm going to read it, I'm going to quote it. Um, and, and what he says is, is that children come to formal education uh, with, an, with an, a range of prior knowledge, skills, beliefs, concepts that significantly influence what they notice about their environment and how they organize and interpret it. And so this, in turn, affects their abilities to remember, reason, problem solve, and acquire new knowledge. And we don't, we, in, in, particularly in, in public schools, and thank goodness your, your sons have a mom, have you, to be able to help organize that. And I think that to some degree, I did with, um, with my children. I have six, three girls and three boys. And, um, and not not that I put any value on one gender or the other, but I but I know that the way in which the world receives my sons is very different, mm -hmm. and and has been, maybe not today, 
but when I was raising them, has been considerably more dangerous for them. And so this whole idea around uh, creating uh, safe spaces for them to be able to do this work Mm -hmm. is significant. So thank you for sharing your story because that, that, we didn't we weren't always able to do that. No. And and I carry that into any African American community that I'm going into and in any African American home mm-hmm. that I'm going into. Yeah. 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 I um I remember cuz I'm reflecting a whole lot with the senior cuz I'm going all the way back to the first day dropping off pre-K summertime and mm-hmm. crying and whatnot. But I remember always taking the stance that While I'm there to represent and to support my children, I'm also paying attention to the other children in the room Yes, and making parents aware of what's going on if they hadn't hadn't been. Mm -hmm. So throughout their school year, I was always alerting a teacher to say, hey, you may go, you may want to check up on Mm -hmm. how things are going. I'm there at the school, had some flexibility but I'm noticing some things that you may want to be aware of. And parents were always first gracious to say, thank you so much for thinking about me and thinking about my child. But coming back afterwards, they're like, I'm so glad you mentioned that because they needed to have an ear on where their child was being directed to and what was really happening and going that. So I see that work um, of how we understand family as that foundation. We're there to support what that family looks like. And then I would go back to looking at families, um, both of our experiences, families were bedrock in our communities. When we did something, we did it as a family. We went to church, we um, helped an, a neighbor to fix their fence or to plant a garden, whatever it was. They were the bedrock of the communities. But families also face so many challenges now, and um, they're more transient. So like myself, I'm here in Oklahoma, but all my family is in California. So when I moved and made that decision, I had to recreate who my community was and what that family looks like. And they supported me throughout all of those transitions and changes as well. So I just like to look at how do we provide that strength and support and resilience for a family that may not have that bedrock of support. Maybe there's lots of abuse or uh, mental health issues or whatnot in their family that they're trying to get up from under. Um, what does that What does that like support look like? Well, what it what it looks like for for me as a social worker, and and it's not just this this part right here is not just African American families, but it works particularly well for African American families because of the um, because of the the I'm gonna say it this way, and I don't mean that it goes away forever, but the suspension of um, written documentation. There are uh, in an, in a classroom, you know, when we're instructing, we're trying to uh, reason skills, right? And so there's that piece, but also um, one of the things that we don't talk about as well in an early childhood setting, we do because there's lots of assessments that go on. Yeah. But once they're in the uh, in the um, public school sector, and which is a little bit broader than um, an early childhood setting, mm-hmm. um, the assessments look a little different. And so and then we have to figure out how to how to help families self self evaluate as well. So so because of the oral uh, way that we do things, one of my go-tos, um, which has become um, kind of big, and I absolutely love it, um, is genograms. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so for those, for those of you listeners who don't know what a genogram is, it's kind of sort of like a family tree with just a little bit more psychoeducational pieces to it. And, um, um, and so a genogram helps me to help the family understand what it is that we might need um, in order for us to um, jail as a community. Now, I'm talking about the family. I'm talking about the child that's in the school. I'm talking about the school itself. I'm talking about the community with with and around the school and um, any uh, any fictive, um, fictive kin, any 
play cousins, aunties, and things like yes, that, yes. <laughs> that, 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 that we bring. Yeah. Um, and so the genogram helps, helps me to um, help that family figure out where we are and what kinds of work we need to do. And that's, um, and it's, um, it works well um, from where I sat because it is oral um, and it is um, creative. It is a piece of art, if I can say it that way. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm developing the genogram on a um, poster board that's, I don't know, that's probably three by five that we can sit on the table and look at and talk about those things that have happened intergenerationally that could be passed down. And it'll help us to see several things, those things where we've been genius mm -hmm. and we've done super well, yeah. but it'll also help us to see some of those things that we've not done so well that I, as a social worker, might call pathology. Yeah, yeah. I when you when you said um, talking about the aunties or those that are not mm -hmm. related, I I chuckled because my youngest we were going to visit family, and I was like, we're going to visit Auntie Lou. You know, and he was like, okay, is this a real auntie or just a pretend auntie? I said, like, this is your real auntie, son, <laughs> and I had to tell him how he was connected to her. And I just laugh because it so depicts what that community looks like. Mm -hmm. I may not be related by blood, but I've been invested in your life. And I know your history mm -hmm. of what that looks like. So when you talk about that, I think about the cultural and historic context of who we are. Right. How did we evolve to be who we are? Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about the genogram. Um, genogram and I would love to like map my family like to do that as a gift I would and, love and to be able to do what's, that what's what's fun for me is is that when I was raising kids and I was a teenage mom too so that's another one of those secrets you just don't talk about um that I've learned to um to embrace that um um it gives me it empowers me yeah. to, to embrace it now but as my children were growing up because our community um was it was it was a I had lots of sisters and brothers, but we also had lots of fictive kin, lots of aunts and uncles. So so there's this whole group of people that my children called aunt who really were not their blood aunts. Yes. But it was no big deal until my youngest daughter started to have children and her children. We I'm preparing because it's just the way we do things from where I sat yeah. that they call those same people aunts and uncles. Right. And my youngest daughter was not all right with that. Yeah. We had to have some family talks about that. Yeah. I don't want, I don't know that I want my children calling, you know, auntie, aunt, because she's not really their aunt. Right. So right. we had to have some dialogue about that. Yeah. 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 I love, I love, I love this, the richness of this conversation. So I uh, would love to continue this dialogue and so we're going to have you and invite you back in to continue this dialogue. But before we um, close out, I just want to share a few tech key takeaways from what you shared. And then I would invite you to do the same okay. um, as well. So one of the like key pieces is the richness of the tapestry of our lives and how as we're living through our experiences, we may not catch all those pieces, mm -hmm. but as we start to reflect back and people engage us in conversation, ask us questions, or even we observe certain things, mm -hmm. we start to understand how we were woven and all those things were woven together. But I also, the imagery I have in my head is a piece of tapestry, how it builds. You have the core strands of the um, weaving loom, and then you weave pieces through each one in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. But the key is that as you're weaving it, you're also pressing it down so that it becomes more succinct, but you don't get to view the fullness of that tapestry until you stand back from it and all those threads are already in there. Mm -hmm. But each thread has a story. So each one of those threads has a representation of someone's life, their story, their experience. Some is, you know, strands that are very um, smooth, some silk, 
And some are really rough, like burlap, and it had to really be pushed down. But in the whole picture of it, it still stands out from that experience. And that's what I think about when we do things in community, supporting families. Everyone that comes to us will be different. And so I'm thinking about, like, what kind of tapestry, if I were to do that for my life, what would that represent and what would that look like? And how would people see me, like view that tapestry? Would it be different than other people? So I know that takes us to a whole nother place, but (laughs) that's what I'm thinking about after sitting. So what would you say are some key takeaways from today's discussion? Um, Key takeaways for me is, is, um, is investing in self. I tell social workers that I'm, that I'm working with, your best tool is yourself. Mm. And so um, reflecting our reflections around who I am and embracing that would be a part of that tapestry. Mm. And for me, um, I'm just arriving at a place where that burlap may be spent into that thin thread that is kind of nicer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, it, it's been rough. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, um, and, and, and I, and so in reflecting on that, um, to see where those finer pieces are, yeah. um, is, is, is a big part of, um, of the takeaway for me. Yeah. Um, another takeaway though, is, is that, um, I am fearless when it comes to working in my community and helping folk reach for yeah. something mm-hmm. that can help us heal. Mm, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Dr. Renee, this has been such a pleasure to be able to just share and sit across the table and talk and engage in conversation. We're all about creating spaces for conversations and spaces that evoke in us a fierceness and a bravery to take on hard things, but also to soften and give ourselves grace for what we've accomplished and what we've done, because it's great. So thank you so much for being here today. And as we close out, I want to encourage all the listeners to, one, begin to share and write down your own story. Start with yourself. You can take a journal out. You can jot down some notes and reflect on what does it mean to be a family in community. And as you're reflecting on that, I would encourage you to look at any type of things that keep popping up and then seek support, help, uh, social worker, therapy. I'm all for uh, therapists and Jesus, so I think we need both. (laughs) But be able to seek that out and to be able to be gentle with yourself, but also be aware of what's going on and what's in your tapestry. Thank you so much, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in. This episode of In the Background of Life with Kelly Ramsey is brought to you by the Possibilities Podcast Platform. 